The Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufactures and Commerce runs a public lecture programme exploring contemporary issues. Teachers TV has access to these lectures and today we bring you the full lecture by Professor Steve Jones entitled The Literary Ape. Steve Jones is Professor of Genetics at University College London. He is a well-known author and a leading expert in fundamental biological research. In today's lecture, taking place at the University of East Anglia, he explores the link between literature and science, looking at literary theory in terms of our history as an evolved primate. We've sent a group of teachers to listen to his talk and we'll hear their responses in a short discussion after the lecture. I know and I'm sure that Steve Jones's work is well known to many of you. He's a professor of genetics um, at University College London, where he's engaged in fundamental biological research. If I understand it rightly, he's actually trying to uh, find answers to the question about why there is variation at all. Um, but in addition to his work uh, as a, a leading research scientist, he's also, of course, extremely well known uh, for his commitment to uh, making scientific inquiry and scientific discovery um, both accessible and entertaining to a wide public audience. He's appeared on television programmes, on radio programmes, and um, it would take me too much time here to list all of the books uh, that he's written. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and honour to welcome Steve Jones. OK, what, what I'm going to be talking about is the tie between literature, literature and science, which in some ways is strong, um, but in, so, in many ways, actually, I think is less strong than some of its proponents actually claim. And that's really what I want to talk about, is the tie which has recently been made between uh, literary theory and the theory of evolution, uh, the extent to which um, evil, the plots, um, stories themselves, may be related to our existence as an evolved primate. Now, clearly, that's quite a striking statement and a rather interesting one, and I believe, and I certainly can't send myself as a, an expert, that there's a, now a whole field of literary Darwinism. Um, I recently looked at a book with a, whose title was far more fascinating than its contents. Its title summarised the um, content of that, uh, of that field. It was called Madame Bovary's Ovaries. Um, <laughs> or Mo Madame Bovary's Ovaries, I'm not quite sure how you should pronounce it. But it's a statement, indeed, that there is a lot to be learned from um, our biology about our literature. Now, many eminent authors have made quite strong uh, affirmations of that truth. Ian McEwan, of course, who is a graduate of this eminent institution, I wonder what became of him, um, wrote in the preface to one of those books, if one reads accounts of the behaviour of troops of bonobos, which are pygmy chimpanzees, um, one sees rehearsed all the major themes of the English 19th century novel. Now, uh, what bonobos get up to, I would not describe in front of a mixed audience, um, but certainly they get, in, get up to uh, serial mating, to rape, if you, use, if you can use that word in the animal context, and to murder. So there's plenty that's going on. In fact, this notion of literary Darwinism is an extension of a scientific field, or perhaps if one was being a bit cruel, you might say a quasi-scientific field, which is sociobiology the notion that we can understand ourselves by referring to the animal kingdom. Now, clearly, that has some truth, which is why we do experiments on testing drugs with mice. But um, I'm of the opinion that its truth is rather more limited than many of, its, many of its proponents might claim. The founder of sociobiology, Ed Wilson, recently wrote, if literature can be solidly connected to its biological roots, it will be one of the great events of intellectual history. So there's no false modesty by the sociobiologists there, but there never has been, so not much change. Well, I have to say that I frequently think of sociobiology as the pompous reaffirmation of the bleeding obvious. Um, it's that old men prefer young women, for example, and uh, that men tend not to fancy their sisters. These things are true, but they don't need a whole science to, in order to explain them. But there are certainly some other human attributes that might be explained by sociobiology. Uh, possibly including literature. And what I want to do in this talk is to explore Gil Gilbert and Sullivan's claim that Darwinian man, though well-behaved, is really just a monkey shaved. How much are we chimps, and do we write books about it? Well, clearly, in some boring physical sense, chimps are what we are. 
And there are aspects of our behaviour which it's hard to deny is related to our joint ancestry with chimps. For example, one of the worst punishments you can give somebody is to send, unless you happen to be George Bush, of course, who's himself signed 131 death sentences, um, the worst punishments you can give anybody is to put them in solitary confinement. And uh, men or women in solitary confinement invariably go mad. Uh, so clear, clearly that relates to the fact that we descend from a social primate like a chimpanzee. If we descended from a solitary primate, like an orangutan, uh, the worst possible punishment you could give somebody would be to send them to a dinner party. I have to say, <laughs> I, have to say I think I've been to those dinner parties. Um, but it's a statement, really, that we can learn a little bit about our nature by looking at our ancestry. But how much can we do that? Um, and how much does that tell us about ourselves? Of course, there are large numbers of people, including George Bush himself, who's, uh, who said famously, uh, the, ju the jury is still out on how God created the human race. Um, some people believe uh, that, uh, that we are not related to the living world at all, that we're specially created in some way. What concerns them, I think, is not the evolution of, let's say, fruit flies, but the fact that perhaps we're not only animals, but just animals. And that really is the statement of what worries people about evolution. That evolution somehow takes us off our pinnacle and turns us into mere um, chimps. Well, I hope I'll be able to persuade you that that's not true. And I hope also that I'll be able to suggest that literary theorists perhaps misunderstand what evolution can and cannot, more important, cannot tell us about ourselves. Now, the idea of evolution itself is, in fact, much older than Charles Darwin. This is one of the very few distinguished Joneses in history. This is a chap called Sir William Jones, um, who was a linguist, as many of you will no doubt know, who in the 18th century discovered, uh, as a boy, that he had the most extraordinary facility with language. Uh, he learned, as a matter of course, um, all the... Um, all the uh, languages of, uh, of, of all the ancient languages, uh, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. He very soon became fluent in the languages of um, Europe. And then he went to India and he learned various Indi uh, Indian languages. And what Sir William Jones noticed was for the first time that there was some kinship among these languages. And he began to make lists of similarity and dissimilarity, many of which are ob obvious. Here are uh, the numbers one, two, three, and so on in English, Latin, Greek, and the ancient. Uh, an extinct tongue of Sanskrit, and they're obviously related to each other, to duo, dua, dva, and so on. Sanskrit stopped being spoken about a thousand years ago in northern India. But in fact, William Jones went further. He suggested that these things had changed by a process of what we now call evolution. And evolu evolution was uh, described by Charles Darwin in three very succinct words, descent, with modification. And I have somewhere on this machine a, um, a recording of the Queen speaking at the age of 15 in 1940 or so, uh, and her speech is really quite dis different from the way most of us speak today and entirely different from the way most of my undergraduates and the undergraduates, no doubt, at UEA also speak. So language changes with time, and because it changes, you can actually make a tree of relatedness. And that's an old idea. I think it was Diderot who said that um, that uh, French, that English is just French badly pronounced, but William Jones took that further and he began to make family trees. And here's a family tree of the word father, um, various Italianate or Latin languages, uh, clearly related, um, and clearly what he, what he then did was to reconstruct the ancestral word in, San, in what he thought was Sanskrit, which sounded a bit like pater. And in fact, Darwin picked up that idea in The Origin of Species, and he says, says as much in the first chapter. So actually evolution began with literary theory, which is perhaps rather a startling thought. Um, and evolution, in Darwin's term, descent with modification, we can simply rephrase in three rather simpler words today, genetics plus time. So there's an unexpected tie there of biology with literature. Um, Lewis Carroll was a no mean naturalist. And of course, Lewis Carroll invented all kinds of fascinating creatures, including the Jub Jub bird and most of all the frumious bandersnatch. What's a bandersnatch? Well, I, my theory is, and just remember, Carroll was really knew what he do, was doing when it came to nature study. A uh, bandersnatch, in fact, was a German, is the German word for a banded snail. Its German name is den Banderschnecken. So um, that's where the bandersnatches came from. I thought you might like to know that. Um, Robert Louis Stevenson also famous for his fiction, of course. He wrote, it is a more fortunate destiny to have a taste for collecting shells 
than to be born a millionaire. And finally, an individual who I corresponded with and I unfortunately never met, worked for many years on the biochemistry of the, um, of the shell pigments of snails. He was a predecessor of mine at University College London. He moved into a notably non-malacological field when he wrote The Joy of Sex. Um, and Alex Comfort worked too for many years on the biology of mollusks. So where does biology, where did biology impinge upon their writings and by ex extension other people's writings? Of course, since, even since the day of Alex, days of Alex Comfort, we've learned a huge amount of what, about what makes us what we are. Uh, we all know about the famous DNA molecule, the double helix, there's a lot of it about. If any one of you consumed by tedium at this talk were to rush out into the streets of Norwich and to be squashed flat by a speeding bus, the DNA in your individual body would stretch to the moon and back 8,000 times. There are many millions of miles of DNA in everybody in this room, um, and uh, all of which comes from the six feet or so in the fertilized egg. It has, of course, been sequenced to give perhaps the most tedious piece of experimental literature ever written, which is the human DNA sequence, 3,000 million letters A, G, C, and T, and that's a little tiny bit of it. Um, there are all kinds of surprises. The actual plot turns out to be astonishingly straightforward. When I was a student, which is a year um, after Ian Gibson was a student in the same place in Edinburgh, we used to talk about hundreds of thousands of genes, perhaps millions of genes, being responsible to make a human being. We now know there are only about 25,000, which sounds like a lot, but which is only about the same number of pieces as one of London's bendy buses. And I like to think I'm more complicated than a bendy bus, but apparently not. Um, what that means, the shortage of genes, we don't know. It probably means that we know nothing at all about the way the genetics actually work. So it's clear, without doubt, that biology, genetics, is important in our lives. And it may well be that that importance is reflected in the fiction we write. Certainly, its importance has grown, or might appear to have grown, um, since, for example, Shakespeare was alive. Um, here's a ch here, it, what I'd like you to do is to look to the person to your left, and the person to your right. I do this to my first year undergraduates in their first lecture, and they look, do this looking a bit blank, and I say, um, well, two out of every three of you will die for reasons connected with the genes you carry. They continue to look blank, um, and then I, then I say, well, cheer up, because if I've been giving this lecture in Shakespeare time, two out of three of you would be dead already. <laughs> and that's true. Because if you look at the patterns of life and death of children in England, there has been a dramatic alteration in the last 400 years. About one in two in three died before 21 in 1600, and uh, by 2001, only one in 100 or so died before the age of 21. And uh, even in Dickens' time, in the uh, 1800s to 1900, uh, half of, about half or a bit less of all children would die, which is why Little Nell, people laughed at the death of Little Nell. It's impossible to read the death of Little Nell without laughing. I've forgotten who said that. And that's because childhood death was so um, familiar. Um, now, of course, things have changed. We're now killed not by the enemy from outside, cold, starvation, murder, infectious disease, overwhelmingly, we're killed by our old friend, the enemy within, which are things like diabetes, cancer, and heart disease, which kill, us, kill most of us, and all of which have some strong inherited component. So it might seem that our fates have been cha has changed um, over the last few hundred years. Shakespeare actually put the uh, problem rather clearly, talking about Caliban in The Tempest, and we all know who Caliban was, he came out with a useful little phrase, which has been picked up by many people, on thy foul nature, nurture shall never stick. And that's where the phrase nature and nurture came from. And that's what I want to spend much of the remainder of the talk talking about, how much of what we are is defined by our genes and hence by our evolution, by our status as, as shaved, as monkeys shaved, and how much by our nurture, by our culture, by our unique human abilities. Well, one of the universals in fiction, and certainly in literary Darwinism, is that men and women behave differently. Well, I have news for all of you arts faculty people. Men and women do behave differently, and that probably has something to do with biology. Um, it's r rather a banal finding, but if you're a Darwinian literary theorist, it uh, actually is taken as very powerful evidence that actually there may be something in this biological story of literature. In one of the uh, classic examples, which actually are not, are not an impressive one, 
um, they use is from the Iliad itself. As we all know, Agamemnon steals his, um, his, uh, his soldier, Achilles' uh, girlfriend, the slave girl, um, what was her name, Briseis, and he does it, he says, to show his power. But what the literary Darwinists say, they go through uh, the Iliad and they notice that every Homeric, ra every rage, and there are many, lots of people get killed in that, involves killing the men and abducting the women. And then, they go, then they've gone to the uh, archaeological records of that time and they find that in the graves there's a great shortage of females. And from then they go on to argue that perhaps in those days, as indeed in places like China today, there was massive infanticide of young girls, so there was a shortage of women. And hence, there was huge uh, pressure on men in order to get a mate. And the way to get a, the only way to get a mate would be to kill off the opposition and to steal their females. Um, and they, uh, they use that as a, an argument behind their um, the claims of a lit literary, story, lit literary basis to much of literature, to, a biological basis to much of literature, including the earliest literature. Well, that's certainly true. There are many creatures where that's true. Things like chimpanzees, indeed, do an awful lot of fighting. Gorillas are even worse. Um, uh, the, ma the, the male gorillas often get killed in male gorillas often get killed in sexual fights. And if you look at gorilla behaviour, it turns out that the alpha male seems to monopolise all the female and fights off any other male that tries to get in. Chimps aren't quite as bad, but they too are pretty vicious. Well, that's fine. So that gives you an alibi for um, literary fiction. Science, perhaps unfortunately, can test some of those theories, uh, which uh, fiction, of course, doesn't have to do. And now there are sort of paternity tests in chimp uh, in chimp bands, and it turns out to be rather interesting. If you look at the sexual success of the big alpha male, the big sort of rugger bugger male, and you look at his DNA and the young chimpanzees, and compare that with the DNA of those wimpish males who go to the library all the time, it turns out that on the average they all do equally well. There are actually two different strategies. There's the alpha male strategy, and there's another one, and I'll use some technical language here, which is called the sneaky fucker strategy, um, <laughs> which is that these, uh, these other males come out and sneak in and pass on their genes when the boss isn't looking. Well, that's fine for literary theorists, too, because in this uh, over, Madame uh, Bovary's Overy's books, so there's an analysis of perhaps the finest novel of all, um, uh, which is Pride and Prejudice, and in Pride and Prejudice we have Needless to say, the sneaky fucker, who is Wickham, who is the seedy little character who comes in and he tries to elope, elope with Darcy's sister and then he finally, if I remember rightly, runs off with Elizabeth's sister and if that isn't being a nasty little chimpanzee, I don't know what is. But that does show the real difference, perhaps, between science and literature. Literature has ideas, but science, unfortunately, needs experiments as well. Well, it's hard to deny that human males are driven by their evolutionary past. Um, we've all got that useful thing called the Y chromosome, which in many ways, politically incorrect though it may be to say so, does drive male versus female behavior. The Y chromosome is a pretty simple little bit of equipment. It's tiny and depauperate and rotting away, as we just heard. It's the most parasitic of all chromosomes, and you've got a few genes on it. Um, but it produces a powerful little chemical, which is called testosterone. Now, men have lots of this, women have rather less. Women have a small amount, which is why elderly ladies sometimes grow a bit of a moustache, but men have large amounts of this stuff. And it certainly makes males male. Here's a picture of a well-known male. Um, <laughs> this is Steve Jones. <laughs> uh, who is not, in fact, me, as you may have noticed. One of my students did come up to me at the end of the, end of the lecture and say, have you not been well, Professor Jones? <laughs> and, I think, and I think they were being serious. Um, this is Steve Jones, who's a bodybuilding champion. Um, and um, what he uh, uh, represents is a statement of what testosterone can do. I'm not accusing him of abusing testosterone, or lots of, lots of bodybuilders do, uh, but he is turned into a super male, big, brutal, rather stupid looking maybe, uh, with a fairly impressive posing pouch, obviously trying, I would imagine, to attract a mate. And well, that's testosterone. Well, if you do take more testosterone, you get into all kinds of problems, because testosterone is actually rather dangerous stuff. Um, here's a a not very cheery slide, or at least for half the audience. It's the patterns of life and death in men and women. And if you look at the top left there, you can see the blue line is the mortality rate in men from the age of birth to the age of 80. And you can see that men die at a more rapid rate than women do throughout. Well, men die from um, 
uh, infectious to, from, from accidental death more than women, even at the age of four. They have about twice the rate of uh, accidental death. It's one of the little known facts of science, that is in fact true, that men are struck by lightning at three times the rate that women are. <laughs> um, men, of course, are, um, are killed and are killers at many, much, many times the rate that women are. Men die also of parasites and infectious disease. And that's because one of the unexpected effects of testosterone is to suppress, to switch down, to, to switch off or to slow down the immune system. So if you've got lots of testosterone, your immune system doesn't work as well, and therefore if you're infected with tapeworms or measles or something, you do much less well as a male than as a female. And the effect is quite really quite big. The power of testosterone was shown by a, a rather unpleasant, very unpleasant experiment that was done in the United States in the 1930s when several thousand young men were castrated for crimes like shoplifting. No doubt uh, um, there are some people no doubt would like to bring that back, but it was certainly done. Uh, all those guys have now died off in the fullness of time. Many of them spent their lives in institutions of one kind or another. And men without testosterone, castrated before puberty, live on the average for 13 years longer than men with testosterone. And that's a lot. That's much more on the average than men who smoke heavily versus men who don't smoke at all. Arguably, the cure is worse than the disease, but it does maybe tell us that actually being male does have some implications which would appear in fiction in terms of adventure and murder and, and tapeworms and God knows what, which isn't, um, which isn't the same as being female. So it's clear that, uh, that um, murder, for instance, homicide, as we see here, is to an extent a male attribute, okay? But it peaks, as we can see, uh, and if you're a sociobiologist or a naive sociobiologist, and there only are naive sociobiologists, you'll see that it peaks in the, in the 20, age of 20 or so when males are trying to find a mate and trying to persuade the females um, what a marvellous husband they would make by going out and murdering the opposition. So certainly plenty of biology about being a man, and why not use that in fiction? How much is that related to our association, our close relatedness to chimpanzees? Well, um, last year, the chimp genome, chimp DNA, was sequenced, and as all of us know, I'm sure, about 98% of it is in common with ourselves. Now, that means less than you might think. 50% um, of the human genome is, in, is common with bananas, so, you know, um, it doesn't mean it's not quite as dramatic as one imagines, but it's quite a striking, it's quite a striking statement. Uh, we've learned more in the last few months about it. Uh, all kinds of odd things have happened. The immune genes have, have, have separated, have, have evolved at great speed. Um, one of the truths, the unexpected truths about being human rather than being a chimp is that we are, in many, many ways, a diminished chimpanzee. We don't have hair. Our muscles are much less efficient than chimpanzee muscles, which is why it's never a good idea to wrestle with even a small chimpanzee. I don't recommend it. Um, um, we, uh, we, we, one of the biggest gene families, as it's called in the human genome, uh, codes for scent and smell receptors. They're nearly all rusted away in ourselves. They're working fine in chimpanzees. Um, and the chimpanzees have been invaded by lots of extra bits of DNA, which we haven't got. So we've got less genetic information that, than chimpanzees have, which is a bit of a surprise, and I'm not quite sure um, how to explain it. Whether you could make a plot out of it, I don't know. But one thing which is very clear is that one chromosome has changed at a rate quite di different from all the others. What this is is a graph of the average change in percentage terms, or in proportionate terms, between humans and chimps from 1%, 1.5%, 2%, and so on on the left, on various chromosomes. And we have 22 chromosomes pairs plus the X and the Y, okay? And the, uh, women have two Xs, and men, of course, have an X and a Y. You can see nearly all the chromosomes, the non-sex chromosomes, have changed about 1 to 1.5%. 1 the X chromosome has changed less than that, in humans compared to chimps, and the Y has changed much more, about twice as much. In fact, uh, what that tells us, actually, is that women are closer to chimpanzees than men are, because men have this chromosome that's actually diverged at great speed. So the Y chromosome, the sexual chromosome, the male chromosome, has evolved very quickly. Why that is, we don't know. There are some other suggestions as to uh, the importance of sex in human evolution. Um, what you can do nowadays is not just look at the structure of DNA, which in the end turns out to be rather boring, but actually look at which genes are working at what particular time, what's switched on and what's switched off. 
And when you do that, it turns out um, uh, that you get rather a remarkable finding. Here we've got various tissues, brain, heart, kidney, liver and testes, in chimpanzees and humans, C and H. And the length of the line simply shows the differences in activity of chimpanzee brain versus human brain, and so on. And you can see there's a, a line that separates chimps and, uh, chimps and us uh, between the different tissues. It's much bigger for the testis than for the brain, which is a bit surprising, but it suggests that at least some evolution goes on much more within the scrotum than within the skull. And again, what, the, what that tells us is really rather hard um, uh, to tell. So it's pretty clear that humans and chimpanzees have evolved away from each other, and it's also, or evolved away from a common ancestor, and it's also clear that the way they've evolved is exactly the same as the way that dogs and cats have separated from each other, or fruit flies and house flies, as, as biological organisms where nothing special, nothing special at all. So maybe all this trying to bring biology into the arts, into literature, is actually quite a sensible thing to do. Well, I actually think that it isn't, and in the last 10 minutes of my talk, I'll suggest to you why. Um, of course, we evolved, um, and you can make evolutionary trees based on DNA, family trees, which show that that's the case. Here's a family tree which puts humans, where the red lines, into the DNA context of various other creatures, chimpanzees, orangutans, and gorillas. Um, and you can see we sit exactly as you would imagine, close to chimpanzees and gorillas, further away from orangutans. Uh, the length of each line tells you how much, how different each individual uh, to, which, to whom that line reaches is from all the others. And if you look at that, there's one very striking contrast between us and all the rest. And that is that we are the most boring of all primates. In fact, we are the most boring of all mammals. Because we haven't changed, at least in our physical structure, our DNA, scarcely at all since we began. Uh, there, is, uh, there is far less difference between the population of France, let's say, and the population of Papua New Guinea than there is between two groups of chimpanzees living maybe 300 miles apart in Central Africa. There's been massive physical changes among the chimpanzees, um, as you can see, and the bonobos are closely related to them, almost none among humans. So we're the, really, the primate that didn't evolve at least in the mechanical sense. Of course, we evolved in some sense. Um, we have quite a good uh, evolutionary trees of fossils and the like that show that over the last five or six million years, we have indeed shifted away from chimpanzees, from the common ancestor with chimpanzees, to ourselves, homo sapiens. But, and we've also, of course, changed, damn, we've changed a lot in other, in other ways too. One of the striking things that happens in the human line and doesn't happen in the chimp line in spite of all the hype about chimp intelligence, take it from me, and I'm just serious, jackdaws and crows do much better at speaking and using tools than chimpanzees do. Parrots do better yet. Um, we got a toolkit. We started using tools. And uh, not just modern humans, but some of their predecessors used tools. And the Neanderthals, of course, uh, were quite powerful tool users. They lived in Europe until uh, more than 100,000 years ago. And they hang, hung around for many tens of thousands of years, and they used tools like this, which scarcely changed during their life history. They were conservatives. They knew what they liked. The, the Neanderthals were arguably the last conservatives. I won't go on cheap jokes about conservatives being the last Neanderthals, because it wouldn't work anymore. Um, um, when we get to modern humans, you can actually see an instant shift to something like that, which is much, much more complicated, a striking change in technology. And that has been a, was accompanied by an ecological shift, which meant that as soon as modern humans met Neanderthals, they wiped them out in exactly the same way as, unfortunately, we're wiping out all the primates and all the large mammals of the world today. And that involved, had nothing at all to do with biology, because Neanderthals and us are biologically almost indistinguishable, as you might have seen on that uh, previous family tree, but everything to do with a uniquely human attribute, which is in the brain and not in the DNA. Clearly, our brain, uh, our storytelling organ, has grown enormously over the last three and a half million years, on the right, through things like Australopithecus and Homo habilis, back to archaic Homo sapiens, which are just before us, to ourselves. And in fact, our own brains are slightly smaller than those of our, of our immediate ancestors, but that's only because uh, we've actually got ourselves physically slightly smaller. Since hum modern humans began, there's really been no change in brain size at all. Um, but there's been an enormous change in human ecology and in human numbers. Uh, the 
if you take what, what ecologists can do and often do is to try and work out, a friend of mine once did, was to work out the relationship between the abundance of different creatures and how big they were, you know, challenging, challenging uh, scientific program. And he discovered to his astonishment, perhaps, that there were more mice than there are blue whales. Well, yeah, you think it's a bit boring, but in fact, they all sit on exactly the same line. Everything just sits there. Uh, body size versus abundance, apart from one mammal, and who's that, of course, it's us, we're about 10,000 times more common than we would be if we were simply another mammal, another ecologically constrained primate. The natural population of the world should, would, should not be 6,000 million. It should be about the size of the population of Norwich. Whether it would be the population of Norwich, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, if we were just primates, that's how common we would be. We'd be rather a rare species. So something has made us very, very different from all the others. Well, nobody really knows, but one of the standard claims is that what made us so different, what different was the origin of language. And once language had begun, once storytelling had happened, which is what language is all about, um, then evolution speeded up in a new direction and with enormous speed. I have the um, dubious pleasure of living in Camden Town. And if I were to get on the tube station on Camden Town in the morning, which is never a pleasant experience, and a Cro-Magnon man, an early modern human, was to come and sit next to me, I probably wouldn't, be, I probably wouldn't notice. Um, he might be covered in mud and grunting a bit, but this is Camden Town, after all, part of the cause, um, because physically he wouldn't really be very different from me at all. However, put yourself in his place, of course, he would find the situation entirely baffling. He'd be travelling at speed underground in the dark with people making strange chirping noises to each other and rustling huge leaves in front of their faces. He would be completely lost. But there has been no physical change between him and me. There has been an intellectual change, which is unique to the human line. And humans have often been described as the eloquent ape. It's noticeable that children, for example, who are born profoundly deaf, babble in just the way as hearing children. There is something in there that makes them want to speak, even if they can't learn to speak without now a lot of special treatment. No other primate is anything like that. Well, there is a story, and it's a slightly oversimplified one, but I'll give it to you anyway, which tracks it down to one particular gene that separates us from our chimpanzee relative. It's a gene called FOXP2, which is involved, it's damaged in a rather strange genetic condition, which is called Williams syndrome, in which children are born who appear to be uh, normal in most respects, but never learn to speak. And if you scan their brains, it's called uh, verbal dyspraxia, uh, a normal groups of people, when they're speaking, the left side of the brain right, um, lights up, and that's the language area. These kids, it's, it's haywire on both sides. When they're trying to speak, there's just a mess all over the place. And they never really manage that language at all. It transpires that that's due to mutation in one particular gene, which has been studied in some detail. Well, I suppose we could even call it the storytelling gene. And it's different in us from other primates. Here we've got a um, uh, family tree again, uh, of putting us and chimpanzees, gorillas and the like, into the context of this particular gene. And there are two kinds of changes in genetics. Those which alter the function of the protein, which is thrown as thick, which are thrown as gray, small gray boxes, and those that have no effect. And it's noticeable that there are two shifts which, between humans and the rest. And that might be what gave us language. And it's noticeable, remarkably, in the last few weeks it's come out, that this gene is much more active in the brains of birds that can speak, like parrots, and birds that can't speak, like chickens. And what the hell that tells you, I don't know, but it's, uh, it's clearly trying to tell you something. So we now have transmission of genes, not just through genes, transmission of, of uh, information, not just through genes, but through stories, through words. And that's a shift from body to mind. And it's a unique talent. And we have a unique ability, which literature gives us, to understand the past and perhaps to predict the future in some kind of uh, rational way. And it alters the way we behave. Let's go back to that, those murderous men. Here's the um, murder rate in England and Wales by age. Men in red, women in green, men being particularly nasty in their 20s and 30s, and some rather, rather grumpy 80-year-old men there. Um, uh, women being much less unpleasant in general. Um, OK. And that's a universal worldwide. Here are the figures from Detroit, and it looks exactly the same. OK, so that's biology. That's the old white chromosome coming out and turning us men into complete bastards, all right? But let's look at that a bit more carefully. Let's go back to the previous slide and look at the figures on the left. Murders per million per year, 0 to 30 um, in Detroit. Murders per million per year, 0 to 1,200 
So the biology is there, but it's dwarfed by nurture, by the environment, by society. And of course, we in Europe, and not just in Britain, have controlled the murder rate by seeing what the problem is, rationalising how to do it, and banning guns. It's been very simple. No other primate, of course, could even begin to think in those terms. We are entirely unique in the way we lead our lives, and indeed, no doubt, in the way we relate to each other in many, many ways. Um, and that's a problem for evolution, because evolution is really no good at dealing with things that are unique, because it's a comparative science. I've been comparing humans with chimps. If you've got something which is entirely stuck to humans, then evolution can't help you. Well, there's a joke which I've used before, which I know Ian Gibson has heard before, um, which my father told me many years ago. He didn't realise it was about evolution, but it was. Um, uh, as you can probably gather from my talk, English is not my first language. I was born and brought up in West Wales in Aberystwyth, uh, which is a very Welsh-speaking town, was then a very Welsh-speaking town, and still is, as long as there are English people in the room, of course. Um, <laughs> and the story goes that somebody went into a Chinese restaurant in Aberystwyth uh, and was served a very good Chinese meal by a clearly Chinese waiter who spoke to him in perfect Welsh. And the customer was astonished by this, so he beckoned over the owner, and I'll translate for you, he said, well, it's amazing. Where do you get this chap from? Who, a Chinaman who speaks perfect Welsh. And the owner looked alarmed and said, keep your voice down, Boyle. He thinks he's learned English. <laughs> and that actually illustrates the question of uniqueness and comparison. Because, of course, to a Chinese speaker, Welsh and English are just dialects of the same language, Indo-European. And he's right. To us, um, Cantonese and Mandarin are dialects of Chinese, but they're in almost incomprehensible to, to, to speakers of the different languages. So evolution is no good at all in describing things which are uniquely human. And of course, um, uh, that's, what, um, that's what literature is all about, describing things that are uniquely human. You couldn't have uh, Pride and Prejudice with chimps in it. It, wouldn't make any, it would make less sense than a tea party. It just wouldn't work. So there's a real limit, it seems to me, in using science to understand ourselves. Um, that really is where biological explanation stops, when we come to the things which novelists are interested in. Darwin, actually, is rather, is rather um, informative on this point. Um, one of his sons was asked about his... He had many, several sons. When one of his sons was after, after his father's death about his father's literary tastes, and he his son complained that it often astonished us what trash our father would tolerate in the way of novels. The chief requisites were a pretty girl and a good ending. And that's my recommendation to the assembled multitude. A pretty girl and a good ending will at least sell lots of books, which is more than any literary Darwinist has ever done. Thank you. Are there any questions? No speeches from the floor. <laughs> Does literature as art have a genuine role in conveying scientific ideas to a general public? I'm thinking particularly of uh, another early evolutionist, Charles Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus, who wrote extensive poetry. Book, yeah, and the, the, lo the, the loves of the plants. Yeah. The question about is about does, li does literature help in bringing science to the community? And Erasmus Darwin, famously Charles's grandfather, wrote a thing in rhyming couplets called The Loves of the, Loves of the Plants, um, which actually some of it isn't bad poetry, but actually, actually is a textbook of botany, um, and, which is very odd, and I can't think of any other equivalent. Um, there's um, J.B.S. Haldane wrote, wrote a poem called um, Cancer is a Funny Thing. Would I had the voice of Homer to sing of rectal carcinoma, is how it starts, but I can't remember where it goes. Um, to, which has, in fact, killed off more chaps than, more, than, than, than were murdered when Rome was sacked, goes, but still. Uh, well, I'm rambling. I actually think, no, I don't actually think that literature has, much of a, has ever had much of a role in bringing science to the public. I don't think it needs to do that. It has more interesting things to do. One of my pet hates, in fact, um, is science fiction. I can't stand science fiction because the two things to me just don't go together. If you look at science fiction, it was a fascinating moment in 1905, I think, um, when the first piece of modern science fiction is written, which is H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. Uh, before H.G. Wells, all the utopian fiction, um, which you might call science fiction today, uh, was the same. Uh, what happened was society changed. I mean, in Thomas More's Utopia, if I remember rightly, chamber pots were made of gold and you know, prisoners were sent to hospital and the mad were sent to prison and so on. Um, but people stayed the same. Um, in The Time Machine, there was a complete change. 
Um, society stayed the same. There was murder, theft, war, but people changed, and the human race split into two. The, uh, the uh, what were they called? The Eloi, sort of guardian uh, UEA types leading on the surface of the top walkway, as it were, and then the Morlocks with these ter terrible swine from Leeds living right down in the basement and down below the ground, um, and they split into two species. And that actually came from directly from science. That came from the eugenics movement, um, from um, Galton, who was very concerned that the human race was degrading. And there was a message in that book, which was that we must stop all these evil people from breeding, or they will turn into a, they will turn into a kind of subhuman. So that's the only real case I can think of where a piece of literary work has produced a scientific message. And unfortunately, the scientific message is entirely wrong. Yes, I was very interested to hear that it's thought that tall women have more testosterone than small women. Is that true? It's said to be true. Um, testosterone, I mean, I, this Y book of mine, uh, which is a mixed blessing, um, I spend a lot of time reading around the scientific literature. And there's one thing about the scientific literature, it's boring, that's for sure. But generally speaking, it's true. I mean, either something is correct, or it's published and found to be incorrect and then corrected. Um, now, of course, literature in the arts isn't like that. It's a matter of opinions on one side and the other, and not one isn't better than the other. What I found completely astonishing about the testosterone literature, it wasn't like the rest of the scientific literature. People would find, for example, the tall, some people would find the tall women have got more testosterone with 500 females, and then somebody would do 2,000 females and not find it at all. And you'd get that all the time. So and there was, in fact, a paper somewhere which looked at the strength of the results on testosterone compared to whether the author was male or female. And if they were male, they found much more effects of testosterone. So it did strike me that something odd was going on. So I think you should take your testosterone with a pinch of salt. Thank you. In the middle, just there. Um, I'm interested to, to what extent the way a man behaves is determined by the amount of testosterone he's got compared to the stories he's heard. That if you've got your graph from Detroit and you, your culture is that a man settles his arguments with a gun, is that murder rate there determined by the films that people have watched or by the amount of testosterone they've got? Oh, I, I would say almost certainly the, the, the films people have watched. Um, uh, there's no evidence that I'm aware of of differences in testosterone between different... Well, it is, but I don't know I believe it. Um, tes Americans yeah. do have a bit more. Um, Japanese are low, but... I think those effects would be tiny compared to the society you live in, you know. I mean, there wasn't a surge of testosterone in 1939 that disappeared in 1945. I mean, it's an entirely social construct. Steve, would you clone uh, Tony Blair or Karl Marx? Why should anybody want to clone anybody? Because it's got potential as a technology. Um, cloning. Well, there, there, there is a clone book, which isn't a piece of fiction, which is probably not very good, which is called The Cloning of Joanna May. Who the hell was that by? Faye Weldon, was it? Um, can't remember. It wasn't a very good book, anyway. Um, yeah, um, that's, yes. Point. The question, I mean, there, there, if you clone somebody, what would you be doing? I mean, you would, certainly wouldn't be cloning a copy of themselves. You'd be cloning a baby. And there's no clear evidence at all that that baby would necessarily have any of the ideas of a, their, their fellow clone. I'm a great expert of a, on cloning, as it happens, because I'm the son of a clone, because my mother is an identical twin. And she was so identical, and this probably explains an awful lot, that occasionally when I used to come home when her sister was visiting, I couldn't tell them apart. And I was about five, and I'd go off screaming into the garden and refuse to come in. I never admitted that before. That's probably why I did genetics. Um, uh, I think that probably... There, there, there is a... There is a I'm trying to rake up literary examples. There is a fascinating twin book, which is um, you know, a natural cloning book, which is Puddinhead Wilson by, uh, by Mark Twain. And that's a great book. I mean, it's Mark Twain's it's wonderful writing. And it's got a fascinating bit of science in it because it's the first case in fiction where fingerprints are used. And it turns out that Mark Twain not only knew that fingerprints were unique, but that identical twins' fingerprints were different. Um, and Puddinghead Wilson solves a crime by discovering that what they thought were one person is in fact two. Um, it's got a great line in it, Puddinghead Wilson. Puddinghead, Puddinghead Wilson gets um, his name, Puddinghead, stupid, for saying about a barking dog, I wish I owned half that dog. And somebody says, why? He says, because if I did, I'd shoot my half. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Gentleman there. Um, William Burroughs said that uh, language was an extraterrestrial disease which infected humans. And it appears from your lecture that language is what has stopped us evolving. Um, do you see a relation there? And if so, what's the cure? Yeah, that's an interesting thought. I think language did, did stop us evolving. Um, it's arguable that if it hadn't been for language, um, 
and we probably wouldn't have spread as much as we have, that's for sure, because that's brought us technology. But if it hadn't been for language, it's quite conceivable that uh, the peoples of, let's say, Africa and the peoples of, let's say, Australia, who are somewhat distinct, um, would have continued to separate and, as, and uh, from the peoples of Europe into different groups, perhaps even the different species, none of the questions. Um, it's actually the case, clearly, if you look at bonobos, the pygmy chimps, they were called pygmy chimps because they're small chimps. If you um, stick bonobos and chimps together, um, which is not a good idea because they tend to kill each other, um, they will not mate. So in some senses, they're, they're, um, they're distinct species. So they have evolved. So maybe, you know, uh, uh, language is what uh, saved us from our evolutionary fate. I shall steal that idea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Jones has argued that there are limits to the idea of using science to understand our unique human condition and the stories we tell about ourselves. Let's hear how our three teachers responded to his lecture and what thoughts it evoked about science teaching, gender issues and storytelling. Uh, in Steve's lecture, he, he draws this distinction between science and literature and he, and he says that there's lots of strong relationships really between literature and science. But I, I was sort of intrigued because my background is as an historian and, and I see stronger links between history and science than between literature and science in some ways. And I think there are links, but history and science are both very evidence-based and very empirical. I don't know what other people thought about that. A scientist will tend to generate his evidence. He will be trying to generate evidence mm -hmm. on the basis of experiments. So he might have made observation which comes up and says, that's evidence for that. But I'll then test my observation. I'll test my theory. Just thinking about children in, in schools, it seems to me that actually learners love open-ended investigations, whether they're in science or history. And I think some of the dullest science is when kids are doing experiments that where actually everybody knows the answer. And in a way, there's, there's not much reason there's not much reason for doing it. But that's an interesting question at the moment with the new GCSEs yeah, which definitely. are saying actually it's not about the science you know but how science works and and we're trying to train children to become scientific thinkers yes. and scientifically literate to be able to speak about and talk about science and actually a lot of science teachers are saying that's not what we're trained to do that's a really hard thing for us to yeah, do. I think it's very difficult one of the things that's very difficult say for science teachers to do is to keep up to date with science especially at times when you are having ex external change imposed on you so you're trying to keep up with methods of assessment you're trying to keep up with developing curricula you've got this year's initiative and next year's initiative when do you actually keep up with the science so therefore actually science in schools even though scientific ideas change and evolve very quickly, actually the science that's taught in school stays very much the same. Mm. And even if you change the curriculum, if you don't change the teachers, then it yes. won't change. And if you don't change the children, because you have to change expectation and um, you know, curriculum is embedded in people and it's yes. embedded in the people who receive it and the people who deliver it. There's, there's more and more mixes of genres of, of mm -hmm. knowledge. So actually being a teacher now is so much harder. So, 50 years ago, even 30 years ago, to be a teacher of science, you might have that canon, or a teacher of history, you might have that particular specialism, and you'd feel really confident about the medieval period or about aspects of biology. Mm -hmm. whereas, whereas nowadays, th those are developing so fast that actually you can't even keep up with those. And anyway, the job of being a teacher is now to enable children to be critically literate across the internet, across so many different subjects. Mm -hmm. So not only can you not keep up your own subject knowledge, but actually being a teacher now, I'm not sure it is to do so much with being soaked in a discipline. A woman who I heard listen, she was on the radio the other day and she was talking about the project to build a fusion reactor. And she was a communications person for the EU. And she started off and her first sentence was, I'm not a scientist. And I thought, oh, well, what are you talking about this to us for? But she was a most brilliant communicator. Mm -hmm. And I learned more about nuclear fusion from her because she was such a skilled communicator. I mean, you could say those people are rare, but actually that's what a top teacher does. Well, that's just what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Teachers are the best communicators of science if they do it well. And I would say they do it because they tell good stories. And well, I, Steve Jones, I mean, what a fantastic storyteller. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it's, the, it's the thing that humans have been doing since we began, telling stories. That's how we pass on knowledge. That's how we entertain. That's how we inspire. That's how we educate. And yeah. science teachers do it just as much. What you have to do is make it human. I think you, you know, if you, it has to have a, either... A, it has to have a relationship to humanity, doesn't and then, it? And then, and then you have a problem because then you'll have children talking about the fact that the potassium wants to steal the no, oxygen. No, I don't mean humanise it. Yeah, okay, I mean, I had right. this debate yesterday with some teachers yeah. who were writing about pollination in terms of Peter Pollen, and, and I'm thinking, well, I'm not sure I like this, but 
Uh, no, what I mean is say how, why it's significant, why it matters to you as a human that this yes. atom is like that or does this. Well, well from my point of view, um, one of the key things that came out of the lecture was this idea of maleness and how much of your maleness is determined by this chemical that's going around in your body and how much of the, your maleness is determined by the culture and the environment that you, that you are actually in. But thinking about gender in school, I mean, we make no differentiation in so many ways between boys and girls and expectations of boys and girls mm -hmm. in school, which is in many ways, of course, quite, quite right. But actually, we do, everybody's very worried about boys and reading, and particularly now boys and writing. Mm -hmm. So we've got this sort of strange situation where we know that boys actually are quite different in many ways, and yet school doesn't actually differentiate so often between boys and girls. And I wonder if actually boys are struggling because school's too feminine. Well, no, but there was an argument I read recently about that the, the feminisation of schools or mm -hmm. those feminine qualities of, or traditionally feminine qualities of um, empathy and um, teamwork and are all the ones that are being praised at the moment rather than competitiveness. And there, there was an article that Charlotte Raven wrote in a few years ago in, in The Observer and she said that she was coming on about the femini feminization of the curriculum and she said that what's rewarded in schools is not necessarily intelligence it's the ability to do to carry on doing mundane tasks do we bring our girls up to be compliant therefore if they're sitting in a lesson studying something that they're finding boring and it's not interesting and it's not stimulating and it's not asking them to do things the girls will never less sit there and and comply whereas the boys will actually say this is rubbish and the way they will explain the fact that this is rubbish is they'll get up and behave badly I think it's a really interesting question to ask, particularly for four and five and six and seven year old yeah. children who are learning in all sorts of ways, very young children, to sort of become socialised into school. And I do, I, I just wonder whether socialisation for a young boy, typically, it, it, whether it's the same, analogous to socialisation for a young girl, into as four, five and six year olds, yes. to those processes of sitting and writing and listening and and being compliant and actually moving around from room to room and being quiet. And of course you get very noisy, very aggressive, difficult girls. It's not that it's to, only to do with gender, but I do wonder if there's a sp there are specific differences associated with gender that actually school is blind to. Well, look at it from another question. If you look at it from the point of view of girls having more highly developed communication skills, girls be more inclined to look at you when they talk to them, mm. be more inclined to do. If they're more socially adept and they're more socially aware, do we in a school create a very complicated environment where we're trying to, with girls, and it's quite a, it, the girls can respond to these varying messages that they're getting from different people and the fact that what we're doing is we're being very tolerant of certain things and we're making it, um, exceptions for certain people, whereas boys who are less socially developed actually like black and white. I want to know what I can do and I want to know what I can't do. And therefore, within the, t with the, in the teaching environment, we create that. I think the thing that came out to me was just that actually science is about stories, that if you don't tell a good story you can't be a good scientist or you certainly can't communicate your science and everything he showed us there that connected with our experience was meaningful to us and I think that was um, my message from it really. Yes. And I guess what came out for me was sort of linked to that which is that if it's language that sets us apart and that gives us science and stories and storytelling, all teachers use language, yes. therefore yes. we're all actually teachers of English before we're teachers of anything else. Is it all? I, I, wonder, if it's a, I wonder if it's a teacher of English. I think we are all um, teachers, and I agree with you more, I think we're all teachers who, that a good teacher uses stories and has to use I think we're all storytellers. Use,